God, thank you so much for your word. What a privilege it is to have your word in our own language, to be able to understand what you've revealed uh, about yourself, about history and your mighty acts in history and as well as the future. We have access to your mind, uh, in your word. And God, not only to have that, but also to have your spirit uh, dwelling in us uh, permanently, taking up residence in our hearts, uh, affirming our adoption even. And God, we know that you are, are eager to make yourself famous to put your glory on display as you always have been uh, since the beginning of time, why you created, that you would uh, make creation, make things outside of yourself to uh, share in marveling at your greatness. And so even as we open your word this morning, I pray that we would do just that, that we would be impressed all over again, that we would be in awe, uh, in fresh ways, God, at your wisdom and what you've revealed is the plan for your church, even that we would be uh, compelled this morning to marvel at the precision and the wisdom of your good instructions to us as a local church. God, you're well aware of where Grace Bible Church needs to grow and strengthen uh, weaknesses that are present. Uh, you're aware of how far you've brought us in the areas where we find uh, strength today. Uh, I pray that wherever, whether we're, we're strong, whether we're, we're weak in whatever areas that you are certainly more aware of than even we are, that you would help us to, to grow still more until we all attain to the fullness of Christ. We know that that's your desire for us, and so we pray that you would accomplish it for your own namesake. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In 1979, Jay Adams, the father of the mod modern biblical counseling movement, he wrote this in his book, A Theology of Christian Counseling. He says, when I spoke at the Rosemead Graduate School of Psychology a few years ago, the thrust of my brief opening remarks was, this program has no reason for existence. Classic J. Adams. Not only can you not integrate pagan thought and biblical teaching, but what you are trying to do is to train people to attempt the work of the church without ordination outside of the church. That is distorting God's order of things. Counseling may not be set up as a life calling on a freelance basis. All such counseling ought to be done as a function of the church utilizing its authority and resources. He goes on to say, in many quarters, there is very little knowledge about and concern for the visible church on the part of Christians. Some of this is understandable, though not excusable, from a historical point of view. This appalling lack of largely has grown out of a reaction to denominational liberalism combined with the lingering effects of an anti-church Darbyism that pervaded Bible-believing churches during the past generation. Both led to a basic distrust of the organized church and provided the impetus for extra-church agencies. This bevy of parachurch agencies, which was spawned in turn, did much to develop a do-it-yourself outside the church mentality. This independent mentality 
neatly fitted the growing professionalism of the modern counseling movement, which during the same period developed alongside of it. A number of other factors collaborated to produce the present situation in which young people can grow up in a Bible-believing congregation, graduate from a Christian college, enter a graduate doctoral program, and never be confronted with the biblical truth that counseling is the work of the church. What Jay Adams was fighting for, laboring for, uh, 40-plus years ago was against the thinking that the pastor's job was to shepherd the soul of people, while it was the psychiatrist and psychologist's job as professionals and experts to treat the mind. Jay Adams was fighting against that kind of thinking decades ago. And really what you had was derelict pastors who had handed over the shepherding of Christ's sheep to the so-called experts in the secular world who didn't know what Christ required, oftentimes didn't care what Christ required of his people, how he instructed them to walk. But this is where the church in mass was being sent to work out their interpersonal and everyday problems, problems in interpersonal relationships and in marriage and with parenting, etc. This is where people were being sent. Now, thankfully, here we are, 40 plus years later, uh, and due in large part to the work of Jay Adams and other uh, pastors, teachers who were uh, foundational to the biblical counseling movement as we know it today, due to their work, we've seen a great shift in that trend uh, in, in many Bible believing churches. Resources abound on how to counsel biblically. Training for biblical counseling is uh, readily available in various parts of the country and even the world. And biblical counselors are much more easily located and available to be connected with those who are in need of counseling. Those are things to be celebrated. And yet, unfortunately, as uh, with many movements, as you solve one problem, you open the door for others, right? We see this historically, um, where where there's tremendous advancement, there's also the opportunity for new pitfalls and new snares. And so I think that where we find ourselves today, as it pertains to biblical counseling, is that many otherwise solid pastors, uh, while they're not so much inclined to send their sheep to the secular experts, there seems to be a growing trend that people in the church with these same age-old problems, instead of being sent by otherwise faithful pastors to secular experts, they're now being sent outside of the church for experts in biblical counseling. And so some of the same problems being fought against by Jay Adams and others are continuing in our day, uh, namely that counseling is being taken outside of the realm of the local church. In some ways, the biblical counseling, which was a sweet remedy for the church at its inception because it strengthened the church to do what it's actually called by Christ to do, which is counsel its own members to instruct them biblically on how to deal with life's problems. That has actually begun to cripple the church as biblical counseling is separated more and more from the authority and oversight of faithful local churches. 
Christ never intended these two blessings, counseling and the local church, to be separate from one another. And so over the next few weeks, what I want to do is convince you, if you're not already convinced, or further solidify your conviction that counseling is indeed the duty and privilege of the local church. Counseling is both the duty and the privilege of local church ministry. We have to be convinced of that. So if you're already stepping into the lives, for example, of others at Grace Bible Church, you're able to identify spiritual problems that need spiritual remedies or weaknesses that need strengthening, uh, then I want you to be encouraged by the next few weeks that you're doing exactly what Christ desires for his church. And hopefully as you hear uh, what, what we unfold over the next few weeks, you'll be affirmed in your pursuits. And perhaps some of you hearing this Equipping Hour series just haven't given much thought to stepping into the lives of other people or taking spiritual responsibility for others. Those who are struggling in the body, who, needs to, who need to grow in a particular area, maybe you just haven't given thought to how to intentionally step into uh, a difficult situation or someone else's life who it may be clear to you that they need growth. I want you to rethink your role then as a member of the local church, how you might effectively contribute in a thoughtful and intentional way to stepping into the lives of others for the sake of growth. And then even maybe for others, it hasn't even occurred that there is a strong indivisible relationship between counseling and the local church. And so I'm zealous that our church gets that connection. Uh, We have to be convinced that it is our obligation and joy to be able to counsel others. So as a starting point this morning, let's define our terms. We're talking about counseling. We need to be on the same page about what we mean exactly when we say counseling. This term shouldn't be scary to you, maybe, uh, well, probably all of you, when you think counseling, the name Tom Angstead comes to mind. That's safe. That's right. Uh, But that that shouldn't be the only thing that comes to mind. Um, To, you know, if, if you hear the term counseling and what comes to mind is an office, uh, a professional relationship, or even worse, a couch. Uh, that, those would be uh, wrong ways of thinking about counseling if that's the only way you think about counseling. Uh, this word is a biblical word, and not only that, it's something that all of you are already practicing, for sure. We're all, in some ways, counselors. Whether you're a parent instructing a child in your home, whether you're a coworker telling another coworker what to do about an unreasonable boss, uh, whether you're a friend helping another friend make a, a difficult decision and weigh the, the different options available. In those situations and many more, you're functioning practically as a counselor. So the question is never, am I a counselor? But the, the better question really is, Am I counseling well? What kind of counselor am I? Am I a a person who counsels when the opportunities arise and when I find myself counseling? Am I counseling in keeping with God's word, with God's wisdom, with his opinion as articulated in the scriptures? Those are, are really the better questions. The term counsel was not something that developed, obviously, in the world. It's not something that the church saw happening already in the world and figured, man, we should do that same thing. We should counsel people, too. Uh, But this is a biblical word. The the word typically that gets translated counsel or carries that idea, uh, in Greek at least, is nutheteo. Nutheteo. 
Um, it, it gets translated various ways, instruct, warn, admonish, counsel, and it comes from two different Greek words, nous, which means mind, and uh, tithemi, which means to put in, to put something into. So you have a, a combination of nous and tithemi. You get nuthateo is a verb that means to put something into the mind. So you can see why it's synonymous with instruction or counsel or warn, right? You're informing the mind of, of another individual, counseling. Jay Adams helpfully identifies three elements that are captured in this word when this word is typically used. There's three things that are present in the idea when uh, nutheteo is happening, which is where we get the, the English sort of transliteration, nuthetic, nuthetic counseling is, uh, was popularized in the 70s and 80s by J. Adams. He's sort of led the way, uh, making that a, a biblical and recognizable term. Nuthetic counseling. But the three elements that usually are, are present with this word are these things. There's a specific problem in view when this uh, nuthetic activity is happening, this counseling, this warning, this admonishing, this instruction. It's a, with a specific problem in view. It also involves verbal communication that provides the solution to that problem. You have some counseling methods that involve uh, no verbal communication. That would not be biblical counseling because counsel biblically involves speaking. So you're imparting knowledge into, into the mind. A problem is in view, verbal communication that provides the solution to that problem. And then finally, the ultimate good of the person being instructed is also in view. It's the good, as God defines it, of that individual being instructed, being counseled. And so someone who is engaged in nuthetic activity in instruction, warning, admonishment, counseling, is uh, using words, using communication to impart knowledge into the mind of another individual with a problem for their good is the idea. You can probably already think of times in the life of the church when that is happening. Hopefully that is happening right now. Uh, at small group, that should be happening. When you get together informally and formally with friends in the church, hopefully that is, that is happening, that you're able to identify weaknesses, areas where help is needed, and you can use verbal instruction as a means of benefiting the person with that issue. That is biblically what counseling is. Uh, just to, to take us to some, some passages where this is seen, we'll start in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 3. When the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek, this word, nutheteo, was carried over and used throughout the Old Testament and you'll be able to see why this gets defined as, as it does biblically. The idea uh, will be readily apparent from these passages that we visit. So 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, God speaking to young Samuel about the current high priest, Eli, he says this, 
For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever, that is Eli's house, for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. That's our word. He did not rebuke them. He didn't warn, admonish, instruct. He didn't counsel them. His sons, who were worthless men, practicing immorality as priests when they served at the tabernacle. Because he did not counsel them, God would judge Eli. Eli was supposed to, as a parent and as the priest, he had an obligation to this on multiple levels. He was supposed to bring verbal correction to his wayward sons. As a parent, he was supposed to do that. As the religious leader of Israel, he was supposed to do that. And he was well aware, we, it's, uh, it's safe to assume, that he knew Nadab and Abihu, the first high priest, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, had been killed for less. <laughs> and so this was something that he should have eagerly stepped into and brought correction. He should have counseled his sons against what they were doing for the good of his sons. And if he would have rendered proper judgment against his sons, then God would not have had to. Fast forward to Job chapter 4. Job's friends, as you know, get a lot wrong and their counsel of Job. After uh, sitting in silence with him for a week, that was what they did well. And then hearing Job's initial complaint, the first thing, interestingly enough, that they acknowledge is that Job has been an effective counselor. Job chapter 4. This is what they acknowledge before they launch into uh, foolish counsel that is theologically accurate in lots of ways and misapplied because they assume to know the inner workings of God's providence, right? To have right theology misapplied, to speak the right theology to the wrong person is foolish counsel. And that's what they do, but they acknowledge chapter 4, verse 3, something true about Job. Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. Knees. They acknowledge in that first line, you have instructed. That's our counseling word there. Job was a biblical counselor, if you will. He instructed people well. That included the subsequent things that are acknowledged in verses 3 and 4. Strengthening the weak hands, upholding the one who's stumbling, making firm the feeble knees. This is the role of counselors. Job being the, you know, by God's assessment, the most righteous man alive during his time, he was a biblical counselor. He practiced biblical instruction. Those who have some problem needing to be addressed, they're they're weak, they're stumbling, they're feeble. Well, Job benefited them through verbal instruction. He strengthened them, he upheld them, he made them firm. That's biblical counseling. Fast forwarding to the New Testament, some New Testament usages of this same word. In Acts chapter 20, that famous scene where Paul, who knows he won't see the Ephesian elders again, they go with him to Miletus, calls the elders to himself there. And in verse 31, Paul refers to himself as having practiced this very form of counseling, this kind of counseling that we're discussing in verse 31. 
Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to, here's our counseling word, admonish each one with tears. Paul practiced this. He practiced nuthetic confrontation, as Adams calls it. Verse 31 says that he did this, and he's calling the elders, right, to to remember his very practice as a shepherd when he was there for three years. Don't forget how I did it. When? Only during office hours. That's not what he says. Night and day. Night and day. Paul practiced this. He did not cease to admonish each one Everybody in the body was fair game, in a sense, for Paul. He was eager to step into the lives of struggling members, uh, weak members, those who needed help to step into their lives. Everyone got a taste of this from Paul's ministry, and he did this with tears. It wasn't cold. It wasn't professional. As he pleaded and prayed and counseled for the souls of the members of the Ephesian church, it involved tears for Paul. So certainly this counseling is the work of the shepherd. A few books forward, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Here Paul is talking to a, a different church, And he even compares in chapter 4, verse 14 of 1 Corinthians what he did to what's seen in another realm of life. I did not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Paul, a faithful shepherd and apostle, when he wrote what he did, uh, in 1 Corinthians, he's not doing it just to, to uh, beat them up with words, right? You get that? That's not Paul's point. He's not writing it just to shame them, but he's writing it for their good, for their admonishment, just like a parent would children that he loves, right? Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, uh, do not despise Yahweh's discipline, do not, nor be weary of his reproof. For Yahweh reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Right? This uh, correction, using words, um, this is the, the role of a faithful parent. And, and faithful parents use the rod and instruction to correct their children. Paul's Paul's referring uh, to that verbal correction here in 1 Corinthians 4, 14. Uh, Again, fast forward to Colossians. You have two references, uh, two uses of this word in Colossians. Once in chapter 1, verse 28, as a reference to Paul, what he did, And then we'll see in the next reference in chapter 3, it's not limited to church leaders like apostles, shepherds. So Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him, here's our counseling word, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Admonition and teaching came from the Apostle Paul for everyone in the church at Colossae. Everyone needed counseling in this this sense. 
This had to be done with all wisdom so that with this goal in mind, we may present every man complete in Christ. And there you, you have that same idea that we've mentioned. This is for the good of the one being counseled, uh, the good as God defines it. Maturity, completion in Christ. And so the counseling work really is not done until we're all complete in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 16. Josh taught on this recently. Why let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God? The word of God must dwell richly in each of us and in us corporately as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. Why? Well, when we do that, when we're faithful to gather and lift up our voices to the Lord, what we are doing is seeking to benefit those listening, specifically by teaching and admonishing one another. There's a counseling word, admonishing. You should sing loud enough for the people around you to be counseled by the lyrics we're singing. That's right. Even if you don't have a melodious voice, we want to hear you. We want to be instructed by you on Sundays. So in 45 minutes, that's your cue to admonish and instruct the people around you with your voices. Josh will let us know if you were louder this week. And then just a couple other passages. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. This is another passage that points to the body-wide obligation of this counseling activity. as well as the specific duty of church leaders. So you have both of these verses almost back to back. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12, and then on to verse 14. Paul says, but we request of you, brethren. So this is a corporate command for each individual believer. Brethren, right? This is for everybody. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you, and have charge over you in the Lord, and give you instruction or admonish you. There's your counseling word. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And then the body-wide command again, verse 14. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. In this admonishment, in this counsel, in this you know, warning and instruction that we would give to others, this is specifically for those who are unruly in their living, who refuse to bring themselves in submission and in line with the way that God says we ought to walk and consist in rebellion and in disobedience. Notice that Paul has various categories in mind for people in the church. Some are unruly. Some are faint-hearted. Some are weak. And those who are unruly are not necessarily faint-hearted. And those who are faint-hearted are not necessarily weak or unruly. It takes discernment and wisdom to discern who's what, who belongs in what category. But if they are unruly, they don't need help. They don't need primarily encouragement. What does it say they need? Admonishment. Verse 14. Admonish the unruly or the idle. And so this activity of counseling, as we've been calling it, is the duty 
of every member of the church. You must be a wise counselor for the good of Christ's church, for the good of this church. I did skip one uh, really useful passage to this conversation, and that's in Romans chapter 15. So why don't you go back there, because I want to pivot here for a minute. Romans 15, some of you may remember if you were here, Smed recently taught on Romans 15, 14. I say recent, that might have been a long time ago. I don't know. But that would be beneficial to go back and, and listen to. As we think about counseling being both the duty and privilege of the local church, this verse is instructive for us. Because in Romans 15, 14, what we're going to see is that it gives us not only the command or the expectation that God has is that we would counsel one another, but it gives some qualifying characteristics that must also be present if we're going to be wise biblical counselors. So that's why this verse is going to help us. I'm going to read it. And we're going to see what those other characteristics that need to accompany our counseling are. Romans 15, verse 14. And concerning you, my brethren, Paul says, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to counsel one another. Even though Paul had not personally been in Rome and visited this church for himself, being aware of their faith and the fruit of what was happening at that church, being eager even to visit them and uh, be mutually edified by their spiritual gifts, he is confident because of what he knows about this church in three things. He's convinced that they are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Those three things should be thought of as a package deal. If any one of these is lacking, then it affects the other qualifications. What Paul is, as he is confident, as he communicates and articulates his confidence in their ability to instruct one another, to admonish or counsel one another, the other two things he's equally convinced of. They're full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. Uh, He's describing a pattern of obedient living as well as a consistent understanding of all things biblical. They are practicing obedience, and they have understanding of of what God requires, uh, and even growing in their knowledge of what God has said. If you are going to be an effective counselor, if any Christian is going to be an effective counselor, these two first characteristics have to be true of you. Right? Individually, as a Christian, if you're going to be an effective counselor, you have to already be practicing obedient living. And you can't just be practicing obedient living if you're going to be an effective counselor, but you also have to understand what's behind the obedient living, what's fueling the obedient living. What are the, the biblical convictions? What are the biblical passages in Scripture? What are the biblical principles? on which obedient living is founded. Both of those things have to be present. Imagine a counselor who might be personally obedient. As far as you can tell, they are walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. This person is faithful in their job, 
Uh, This man, perhaps, is faithful in his home. He's faithful generally as a parent, it seems. And there's nothing glaringly wrong with his life in those areas. But say this this same would-be counselor doesn't have the biblical, biblical acumen to explain why his life looks the way it does. Even with that kind of man who appears faithful, as far as anyone can tell, he couldn't really articulate for you the biblical principles necessary to live zealously for the Lord. That would not make a very good counselor, would it? You couldn't go to him for instruction if he, couldn't, if he didn't have the biblical knowledge to articulate how to live faithfully even if he generally was obedient. So being full of goodness without being filled with knowledge equates to an insufficient counselor or an unbiblical counselor. Take another example. Imagine a mom with well-behaved children, a tidy home, and a happy husband. As hard as those things are to happen at all at the same time, imagine that it were possible that it happened. And in this woman's life, another struggling parent, struggling wife wanted to know from that mom, how do you do it all? How do you accomplish what you have in your children? How do you get them to listen like they seem to? Can you help me learn how to relate well to my husband and not be a burden to him at home? If that wife and mother, as much as she might be doing well, could not articulate the biblical principles that she and her husband have put into practice in their home, then she wouldn't be a helpful counselor to another woman seeking to learn how to faithfully live out what God's called her to as a wife and mom. That's what it's like having uh, a counselor who just lacks the biblical depth to communicate clearly the biblical principles needed to instruct someone else. So you can't just be full of goodness. You have to aim higher to be a good counselor and to be also filled with knowledge. That's personally, that's corporately, the same thing applies. If a church had lots of people who were just really sweet Christians and yet couldn't navigate their Bibles, were were just biblically illiterate, generally speaking, then it wouldn't be helpful to a newer disciple. They might gain some really nice friends and some really uh, beneficial company to spend time with, but growth is going to be stunted because they can't be instructed from the Scriptures where to go to get those principles for themselves, to develop their own convictions, and then to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord that he's called us to. And certainly the same is true in a person or a a church that may be filled with knowledge, but not full of goodness, right? So you, you take the opposite. A person who assumes the role of counselor, who's full of knowledge. I can tell you where to go. Oh, marriage, Ephesians 5, Genesis 1 and 2, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 31, 1 Peter 3, 1 Timothy 2, Titus 2. I can tell you where to go for marriage. But my own marriage is not worthy of imitation. If someone came to me and got the dispensing of biblical principles and yet didn't see those things lived out, so that my wife is burdened by various sins, weighed down and anxious and fretful because she's being unshepherded, right, by ways that I'm contributing poorly to my marriage. I don't serve at home. I'm demanding and harsh. My children are undisciplined. And someone looks into my home and goes, man, I see the the biblical principles sound really wise. But when I look at your life, counselor, I don't, I don't, um, there's a disconnect. 
the person being counseled might be led to the conclusion that God's instructions are really wise, but they're really powerless to change the person who believes them. And that would be an indictment from your life and counsel on God's power. And we don't want to be that because we fail in obedience as we're filled with much knowledge. So both things have to be present, obedience and understanding, if we are to be effective counselors. Now, just as a, a, a caveat to make sure I'm clear, we are not talking about perfection. You get that. It's not like you need to have mastered obedience, perfect obedience, before you can step into li the life of someone else and then instruct them biblically. It's not like you need to know, you know, have memorized your entire Bible, although that would be helpful, before you can step into the life of someone else and tell them anything that the Bible says, okay? Um, otherwise, none of us would be counseling. This, uh, this happened to me recently when we were sitting with friends and talking through parental discipline and in the moments that we're talking about biblical discipline and I'm trying to strengthen this dad to not instruct instead of discipline, don't give instruction and reason with your two-year-old or your five-year-old or whatever when they really, what they really need in that moment is discipline, right? And then one of something, you know, we hear a crash or a door slam and I go over and one of my children who needs discipline, what do I do? I instruct him instead and come and sit back down at the table. <laughs> and when the inconsistency was pointed out to me, I said, excuse me, I need to go uh, correct that. <laughs> so we're not talking about perfection. We all have blind spots. And thankfully, we are there to point them out in each other. Uh, but the, the point is that where these things are present, someone who is faithfully pursuing the Lord, uh, cutting off areas of sin in his own life, in her own life, and growing in biblical knowledge, understands the biblical principles behind uh, some area where someone else needs help, we should be eager to step into one another's lives. We have to be. This is our, this is our job as Christians, right? And as we heard last week, uh, from Smed, this is what God, one reason why God has saved us into a church. Go to, go to Ephesians 4, because it would help us to get our eyes back there. As we've talked about recently, Christ graciously has given gifts to his church those uh, categories of, of leaders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. The pastors and teachers of this church being a gift to the church are specifically intending, verse 12 in Ephesians 4 says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. In this passage, the reference to doing the work of service is not specifically to the pastors and teachers. The work of service is for the members of the church, the saints. It's the job of the members of the local church to actually carry out the work of ministry. And the pastors ought to be equipping the church to do that. That's what equipping hour is about. I heard of one church who, in their weekly bulletins, would have uh, two sections just next to each other, one with the heading pastors, elders, and then the list of names, and then beneath that, ministers. All the members of their church were listed. That's the idea. The ministers, 
the ones carrying out the work of ministry, obviously not separate from the elders, not ex- to the exclusion of the elders, but you should think of yourselves as church members, as carrying out the work of, of ministry. This verse 14 or verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Again, that's where we're aiming. We're not done in this activity of producing, stimulating growth in one another through counseling one another until everybody altogether is mature to the fullness that belongs to Christ. So obviously we're never done so long as we're in this life. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. There it is. You have a job to do. This, the maturing of the church happens through verbal communication, You've got to be able to articulate truth for the sake of the body. Not just the pastors, not just the teachers, but you, the church member, have to be able to articulate biblical truth for the good of the rest of the church. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, dot, 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 causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. As we are in close contact with each other every chance we get. Equipping hours, fellowship before the main service, fellowship after the main service, during the main service, while we're singing, during the greeting times, as you're able. During night services, starting August 1st, and before and after that, We get, during small groups, during uh, counseling classes on Monday nights, and all the other things that happen informally, right? Those are just to name some formal things happening that's on the calendar. And then add all of the informal times as you watch the Phoenix Suns game this afternoon or whatever else you're doing. When you get in close contact with Christians, this can be happening, There's opportunity for this, to cause growth in another. And in large degree, that just takes having a mindset that's willing to identify, to notice weaknesses, right? When you're at a small group or in the presence of of parents and you see undisciplined children or uh, that husband is oblivious to the shepherding that needs to be happening, And he's carrying on conversations with friends. He's trying to build them up. And what his wife really needs is to be helped, (laughs) right? Having, noticing those things, being willing as you hear what's happening in the lives of other saints to come alongside them and say, hey, can we grab, can we grab lunch? You want to come over for, for a meal? And then you rate, you intend You schedule those times and then intend to have conversations about those areas of much-needed growth, if it's needed. You can do that. Um, Just to to give you an idea of just some things to be mindful of, uh, you know, so-called counseling issues, where we should be eager to step into the lives of others and, and help Just to name a few. Ignorance in new believers regarding basic Christian doctrines and practices. If someone came to Grace Bible Church today, first church service they've ever attended, heard the word, were convicted, believed the gospel, and thought, what do I do next? It's July 11th. Today is the 11th. Now what? Hopefully, your only answer wouldn't be, you should really sign up for a build in in September. 
Because they, they shouldn't wait till September to start growing, right? They should step in to build. That's going to be a tremendous benefit to them. And they're going to get great teachings about basic Christian practices and, and things that are knowledge that's foundational to Christian living there. But what do they do? Are you prepared? Are you able? Are you willing? Because you're in a constant flow of pursuing the Lord, practicing obedience in your own life, growing in your, your knowledge of all things biblical, are you then able to step into that person's life and say, hey, let's spend some time together. Let's start talking about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe there's a good resource like the Fundamentals of the Faith book at the book table. You might want to go with, through with them. Maybe there are just passages that you've memorized or books of the Bible that you think, Oh, John, the book of the Gospel of John, to really learn who Jesus is, or First John, that they could read, and I can teach them how to just read their Bible for the first time and mark up their Bible and learn what it what it means for for a Christian uh, to to live the Christian life, to know what they should know about Jesus, how to love one another, how to walk in a way that demonstrates love for the Lord. Maybe I'll take them through Ephesians so they can get a big picture view of salvation. Maybe I'll just take them through Proverbs, encourage them to read it. We'll get together once a week and talk about the seven chapters that we've read the seven days prior. There's all kinds of things you could do as someone who's taking spiritual responsibility for that brand new believer. And are you willing to do that? The, the best, some of my favorite phone calls are... Not, hey, this person could really use help. Do you have time on your calendar to fit them in? I like those. What I like better is, hey, I'd really like to step into this person's life, and I'm not sure what to do next. Can you give me some direction? Because then I get to equip the saints for doing the work of ministry. Uh, if you are at small group or in... Uh, the narthex here, and, you know, lots of children. You see families hanging out there. Are you, if you see consistently the same, the same parents with unruly children, are you prepared and willing to step into the life of the parent? Say, hey, Dad, let's grab lunch. Let me maybe do some investigation. Maybe your observations are, are accurate. Maybe they're not. So you ask, you lead with questions. And maybe what's revealed is some weaknesses in, in parenting and thinking about that. And so you say, great, let's keep meeting and let's open up God's word and let me target some, some areas in your life or in your marriage uh, that need help. Uh, maybe a husband's being passive at home and you can tell when his family is out in public and you're wanting that person's good. So as an act of love, being willing to step into that husband's life. Uh, maybe it's not passivity. Maybe it's heavy-handed leadership at home, which is apparent. Uh, maybe it's a lack of, lack of affection from a man to his wife. Maybe a wife is failing to submit to her husband proper, properly. Maybe she seems to need help in her management of the home. And so, ladies, you're able. If you're an older lady, you can. Uh, you hopefully have the time to just go and spend time with that young mom in the home. Um, I love knowing that Sarah Demarest, uh it does that regularly for, for my wife. And I can always tell because I'm like, man, that's, that's helpful counsel for me. And I get the play-by-play the, uh, -play later. Uh, if, if bitterness or anger arises in a small group conversation or in prayer requests, you think, man, I should follow up with, with that person and step into that situation. Uh, maybe through uh, an awareness of social media that's available through social media, you recognize weakness in somebody's speech or their priorities in life or their time management or their exercise of Christian liberties. Are you prepared to step into that and counsel, disciple someone to greater maturity? And then a host of other common-to-life issues that we can be ready to step into. 
Um, things like ignorance of how to change and repent, generally undisciplined living, mismanagement of finances, wrong thinking about gender roles, how to be a biblical man, how to be a biblical woman, unrestrained eating habits, overemphasis on someone's health, uh, failure to prioritize body life in the church, sexual immorality, impurity, decision-making, partiality and favoritism, all those biblical issues that are in need of, of refinement and growth. Last thing I'll say, because I'm, I'm over time, as we, as we think about church planning, as we think about needing to reproduce ourselves somewhere else, you do realize that it is crucial that we have people in Tempe and everywhere else we go who are able and willing to do this. As we send a, uh, some portion of our church to another part of the valley and then eventually to New Orleans. There have to be people here who, when newer people come into Grace Bible Tempe, they can raise them up and disciple them and counsel them so that they're mature and so that we're not just left because we've emptied the church with lots of new immature people at Grace Bible Tempe. Elsewhere in the valley and in New Orleans, when there are people who come into those churches, they will need to be taught how to be mature Christians. And so people who have grown up here at this church have to be able to reproduce maturity that God's produced in them somewhere else. That's, if we don't have that, we, we can't church plant, you realize. And so as you're thinking about these great endeavors that we're aiming at, Aim to be useful by being one who can adequately counsel. And in the weeks to come, we'll talk about why this can't be separated from the local church and how, unfortunately, in our day, it has. So let me pray. God, thank you so much for, again, your wise words to us. Help us to be submissive and obedient to it and give us much success as we uh, apply all diligence to maturity in Christ and being wise counselors of those in the body. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.